So I want to thank uh, the Counter Extremism Project for challenging me with thinking about a topic that um, is clearly very of the moment, but but not one that I focus on uh, in my day to day work, which is really what has been the impact on the attacks of 9-11 on American society. And I decided to look at that through three different dimensions. Um, one, how has that affected American foreign policy? Two, what has that meant domestically when it comes to intelligence? And three, alluding to some of the issues that, that Fran brought up and the rise of right-wing extremism and was the topic for the first half of this conference, uh, what I'm calling Xenophobia America. So with that, why don't we just uh, jump in? So the first dimension is this neo-isolationist foreign policy. And as you can see from the two cartoons, which in some ways you know, illustrate the phenomena uh, you know, better than, uh, than words can, um, this is actually a bipartisan or issue in the sense that we're seeing this neo-isolationist foreign policy emanate from some sides of the Trump Republican Party, but also from the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party, and in fact, you know, influenced the Biden administration's decisions here on Afghanistan uh, that Fran recently referred to. So what are we really talking about with a neo-isolationist foreign policy? Well, number one, you know, this phrase, the forever wars. Um, we've got a younger generation of Americans who are very much part of the uh, progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Um, but Donald Trump, if you remember, also tapped into this. And they've said, hey, these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya, these are too expensive. Um, we need to invest at home. And there's a view that uh, President Trump had tapped into that the foreign policy elite in Washington have, quote unquote, messed things up. Um, there's a frustration that that policies that were implemented uh, in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, haven't worked. And certainly uh, the events from the last week or two certainly underscore and will further uh, energize that view. Also, you know, the United States has, has, has suffered from overstretch. Um, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, how many places can the United States play a role? Um, you know, if the, the view that liberal international liberal international has had with the United States has taken on this role is now coming under pressure uh, in the U.S. And so what should the grand strategy be for the U.S.? Well, again, you're hearing this from elements in the Republican Party, as well as from the progressive Sanders wing of the Democratic Party, neo-isolationism. Let's reduce our footprint uh, overseas. Um, and this is, this is the context with which we have to look at uh, this departure, um, this capitulation in Afghanistan. And, you know, part of the view is that after the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Syria, that the U.S. can't change the world. And maybe um, we have overstretched our efforts. So when you think about in the United States, uh, foreign policy, in some ways, one could argue that things are more like 1919 after World War I than 1945. And transnational architecture, the post-World War II architecture, things like the UN, NATO, Bretton Woods, um, these could not possibly pass the U.S. Senate uh, currently. And a perfect example of this was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, that failed uh, in the Trump administration. Trump administration didn't decide to pursue it, and neither has the Biden administration. And you look at some of the polling, this is going back to 2019, the Center for American Progress. Um, and you can really see that on the right side of this arc, um, you have 54% of the electorate either is engaged disengaged from international affairs and feels like the U.S. needs to pull back, or what they call Trump nationalists, um, where you know, the U.S. Uh, should have a strong military but really reduce that footprint overseas. So you have a majority of, of voter segments moving away from global activists or traditional internationalists, which now only represent 
18% of the electorate. So I think, you know, the attacks of 9-11 and the interventions that followed um, that the United States embarked in have had an impact on the domestic view of what U.S. foreign policy should be. And I should note, I'm not endorsing these views far from it, but uh, this is an observation that, that I'm making, uh, and it will have future implications for U.S. foreign policy. So let's move on to number two, uh, the deep intelligence state, right? Um, you know, your, all of your internet searches, your emails and your cell phones are accessible to the state. You can see the Statue of Liberty there, now with cameras shooting out of her eyes and uh, some type of radar sensors replacing the torch. Um, you can take precautions if you want to be a terrorist, but your digital history and those of your collaborators are, are still available. And you've got digital exhaust and footprints. Um, and you know now it's really not only are there cameras watching you, but thanks to the collection of big data, when we think of what Google is collecting, even your thoughts at some level, you know, your searches, uh, that metadata is being collected. And I want to give credit here to uh, two, re two recent authors, Thomas Hegammer, who's got an interesting piece in Foreign Affairs, and Spencer Ackerman in Reign of Terror, a uh, recently re released book, who talk um, about these issues and the fact that the United States has really transformed from sort of a lumbering giant surprised by terrorism to one that is now nimble, uh, collecting and managing its way through vast amounts of data. Um, how did we get there? Well, you know, one of the reactions to 9-11 to was that the United States government figured out that counterterrorism counter is really a race, a race between the state and terrorist actors. Can the state identify them before they can, can strike uh, their networks using some of this data collection? And number two, you know, the government significantly increased the number of terrorism analysts working uh, after 9-11. And in fact, I was part of that group and, and furthered that by hiring terrorism analysts at NYPD. But you've got new agencies, the National Counterterrorism Center, the Director of National Intelligence uh, Agency, the Department of Homeland Security, and even NYPD that all added as part of their mission or had their mission to collect and analyze information more comprehensively and faster. And for those existing agencies, FBI and NSA, uh, they had to design new systems to collect signals intelligence. And as technology changed, big data and social media uh, became the, the key elements to exploit. Uh, companies like Palantir, with their ability to parse through vast amounts of data and find connections that one wouldn't otherwise find. Uh, computer scientists helping the government agencies vacuum up metadata from telecom companies and inter internet providers, all with the goal to prevent terrorism attacks. But this, frankly, increased the capabilities of the U.S. government uh, to really sort of be this deep intelligence state. Also, laws changed. Uh, laws were changed that lowered the predicate for beginning investigations, whether it was the Patriot Act um, or other new laws that were put in place. Banks now had new counterterrorism finance obligations. And frankly, the NSA pushed the limits on the boundaries of, of data collection. And there were implications. And what were the implications? Some of those that uh, Snowden revealed. Um, and then frankly, you know, the United States, as with other Western democracies, when faced with security threats on their own soil, most Western states bent their own rules um, when it came to the self-professed liberal ideas. So um, quoting Thomas Heghammer here from his recent article, rebellion is a battle for information. States can now exploit the new technology on the scale that small groups cannot. And this really is uh, an assessment of where we are right now. Uh, terrorists have a challenge. Um, they can't operate on our soil, but when they come to the United States, uh, there is this race for them to act before they're detected. And a lot of these changes, uh, the ability, the enhanced ability to wiretap, financial monitoring, electronic data collection, these are really um, results of the war on terror and the attacks of 9-11. Again, not something that I take issue with, but just an observation. 
And then the last dimension, I think, is the change threat. Uh, one that, frankly, Europe has been ahead of the United States on, um, and not necessarily in a positive way. But I think what we're talking about here is that, um, you know, some of the concern about uh, violent jihadism that shaped American politics after 9-11, to some degree, set the ground, created fertile ground for right-wing extremism. And as you can see, you know, in that uh, cartoon in the bottom left, you know, there's this sort of evolution from not only the, the threat levels from red to green, but also from Muslims to Mexicans. And obviously, this was a topic that the Trump administration and the president himself, uh, you know, talked about repeatedly from the moment he came down the golden escalator uh, in Trump Tower. And frankly, if you look to the right, um, it really is a commentary, I think, somewhat accurate, um, you know, although we can't really choose. Um, where the threat comes from. Um, yes, the threat now and, and even more so uh, than in the past years is from Afghanistan, but certainly the threat at home uh, is one that we're very concerned about. And if you listen to statements that the DHA set, D Department of Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas made, uh, the greatest threat that the United States face is the domestic terrorism threat. So, you know, how did we get here? Well, at some level, you know, a lot of the, uh, the jingoism on war and terror uh, really sort of hyped this threat. It was us versus them. Uh, it was an Islamic other. And it sort of was a gift to those who might peddle xenophobia, white supremacism, and Christian nationalism. You know, the enemies were dark-skinned Muslim foreigners bent on, on murdering Americans. And, you know, this, this transitioned to something that we saw during the Trump administration, to fear mongering about the southern border. And it, people from Central America uh, who were trying to come to the United States, and frankly, to other minority populations. Now, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, there is great demographic change coming in the United States. Uh, you know, we know that that some refer to this the great replacement theory. Um, but, you know, in in 2045, the United States is be going to become a majority minority country. Um, and there are elements within, um, you know, some pockets of the white majority who will feel displaced by this. And that has sort of provided fuel to xenophobia America. Uh, there's also the fact that law enforcement and intelligence uh, for the last uh, almost 20 years have really been focused exclusively when it comes to extremism in the United States on the jihadist threat. Um, the right wing white supremacist threat just wasn't one that was on the board. It wasn't one that we were considering. Um, so our eyes uh, were not focused in this area. And, you know, if we talk about you know, some of these uh, demonization that activated or really mobilized white supremacism uh, and violent anti-government libertarianism. You know, now the FBI said they've got 2,000 open inv investigations into domestic violent extremism, and that's double what they had in 2017. And in fact, last year, the ADL said that white supremacist propaganda, flyers, posters, banners, stickers, uh, is double what there was in the, in the past year. And then talking about terrorism itself, two thirds of the plots in 2020 were from the white supremacist anti-government uh, stream of extremism. And as we know, this really all came home on January 6th. Um, with the attack at the U.S. Capitol, sort of a brutal assault that was fueled by these right, far-right ideas that have gone uh, mainstream. And, uh, you know, just to close here on this topic on Xenophobia America, if you look at some interesting data captured by the New America Foundation, uh, tracking the number of people killed by different types of ideological terrorism, you see that the red uh, line, which was jihadist, has now been superseded uh, in 2018, 2019 by far right wing extremism and uh, doesn't bode well for the future, but certainly reconciles with what we're hearing from the Department of Justice, from DHS about the threat from domestic extremism. But let me stop there. Thanks again for uh, having me participate today.